a grip, snaps his teeth round the day, like a cold horse climbing down. that beef, chili's a lot of bother to make on the high end of a chuck wagon. Still in cold weather, I whip up a batch of chili about every few weeks, and these new style cowboys whine and blubber for it more often. Cowboys today is mostly a crowd of sissies. in a cowhide sling under the rear axle, fetching the bed rolls in the wagon. Then they ate what I give them and they got wet when it rained. Now look at this dang camp here with this wagon, this big tent for them hands to sleep under. <laughs> Don't look like no cow camp to me. Why, this tent and all looks more like we're holding a gospel <laughs> tent meeting. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> 
making those old ponies more polite than the horse breakers did back in your day. Why, we usually have them acting pretty polite for the boys fall hair to them for the roundup. Yeah. Now, if you're spoiling the sea folks get thrown, Cap, come down to the horse breaking ranch when we're just starting to educate the young ponies. Yeah, you a fair to middling cowboy, McElroy, but you ain't near the man your pappy was. Now there was a cow hand. <laughs> I sure was good at working out the heavy breath country for cattle. Yeah. 
Turns out those wonderful biscuits yeah. and chili yeah. and SOB stew. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what's SOB stew? Huh? <laughs> well, what is it? Tell him, Buck. Me? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, he gets these kind of big green things, see? Uh, yeah. 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 And he chops them up like that. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Throws it all in the pot like yeah. that. And then he gets these. These real slivery little red things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he puts him in their hole. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. And then there's this big, long, white thing that's just the most disgusting. <laughs> oh, I'll be a son of a bitch if I know what all goes into it. <laughs> you know, different cooks put in different things. Yeah. Yeah. But it sure is good. Now, one thing in there for sure is margut. What's that? Well, why, more guts are decisive ingredients. It's what gives SOB its flavor. Now, a son of a bitch may have no hearts and no brains and still be a son of a bitch. But if it ain't got no guts, it ain't no son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, actually, more gut is neither mar nor good. But that long tube connecting the two stomachs of cud chewing creatures. That's what the hell they are. that's it. Uh -huh. yeah. And seasoning's a matter of personal choice. Well, now, some cooks throw in a lot of chili pecanios and other hot peppers with, with just enough water over the meat to cover. And it is cooked slowly for three or four hours until thoroughly done or tender. The SOB shouldn't boil much, just simmer. Hardest thing for women in making SOB is stand around seeing its simmers and don't file. <laughs> well, now, a student at the University of Texas, Ms. Catherine Young, once wrote an essay in praise of Son of a Bitch too. Well, it was in a class taught by J. Frank Dobie and Professor Dobie Giver, A plus on the paper. <laughs> decade by decade, I, I followed the Texan's career. Search for a peculiar contribution which they might have made to civilization. Mm -hmm. they robbed and prayed and fought and died. Mm -hmm. It is no new chronicle. <laughs> what have we <laughs> that the Spartans lacked? That the Roman centurion knew not? That the Puritan needed and the Yankee ignored? What? Texas' greatest contribution to civilization was son of a bitch stew! <laughs> It is the peace that resists stomps of the chuck wagon. <laughs> 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 
in a nice way, replied the old cowboy. <laughs> when Odessa was first becoming a town, it was considered a pretty rough town. Yeah. With lots of mean men running around loose. Yeah. Yeah. Now the neighboring towns considered the early Odessa pretty uncivilized. Mm -hmm. And these towns had a joke. They said a gentleman in Odessa would be a son of a bitch anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the olden days, uh, men used the cafes in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico sometimes had an entree printed as uh, Gentlemen from Odessa Stew. <laughs> as a polite way of listed SOB. <laughs> well, sometimes it was listed under the name of a personage currently in public disfavor. Well, for example, after President Grover Cleveland run the cowman out of the Cherokee Strip, some cafes started printing Grover Cleveland Stew. Right. <laughs> and during the Depression of the 1930s, it was termed Herbert Hoover Stew. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, you might be listening. Hey, you get the general idea. <laughs>
SOB. Steelers, nothing can compare to that big old bowl of blessedness called chili. Now, when referring to a bowl of red, I'm referring to chili con carne. Honest to God, chili. Real chili con carne is a hot and mystic thing. While my taste buds almost ache with longing when I recall the chili of my boyhood. <laughs> And I'm most overcome with emotion when I think of them Da Vinci's of the pepper pod who believe that every pot of chili has a soul. I dearly love my first bowl of red, although it was hot enough with peppers to bile on a cold stove. Why, nearly hot as hell's brimstone. Soup of the devil, some call it. Well, the dying words of Kit Carson that great frontiersmen were. Wish I had time for just one more bowl of chili. And Harry James, that great horn player, declared. <laughs> Next to jazz music, there's nothing that lifts the spirit or strengthens the soul more than a good bowl of chili. Yeah. But during the years I traveled over the country with my jazz band. I was constantly on a search of cafes that served Texas-style chili. Yeah. yeah! I seldom found one. Oh. Congress ought to pass a law making it mandatory for all restaurants serving chili to follow a Texas recipe. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> well, I say the best chili is now made in Texas and always has been made in this province since the dim beginnings of that pepperine delight. Yeah. Wow! Almost all real chili heads agree on the superiority of the original bowl of Texas Red. <laughs> chili is not so much a food <laughs> as a state of mind. <laughs> Addictions to it are formed early in life, <laughs> and the victims never recover. <laughs> on blue October days, I get this passionate, yearning for a bowl of chili. <laughs> and I nearly lose my mind. <laughs> There's nowhere I can go in New York City to buy the real fun. <laughs> oh, now, now, Ms. Lyndon B. Johnson, Ms. Johnson experiences the same autumnal chili pangs only in November. <laughs> Johnson's recipe, which leaves out one ingredient, beef suet, and puts in two other ingredients, maters and onions. <laughs> now, the real original Texas-style chili recipe didn't contain any vegetables except chili peppers and burning capsicums uh, and a few other spices derived from the plant kingdom, but no maters or diced onions as in the Perdinales River recipe. President Johnson's favorite is style Perdinales River chili is prepared on the LBJ ranch on the Perdinales Ronald Perdinales River <laughs> in the Texas Hill Country by his famous chef Mrs. Zephyr Wright. Oh. <laughs> now the LBJ 
DJ formula also calls for venison, if available. The meat of the hill country deer is usually very <laughs> Otherwise, beef as fat-free as possible is you. The ingredients for Padin Alice River chili are four pounds of chili meat, one large chopped onion, two cloves of garlic, one teaspoon of oregano. Oh, Spanish for the wild margarine that grows in Texas. One teaspoon of ground cumin seed. <laughs> Six teaspoons of chili powder. And more if you want it warmly flavored. <laughs> Two 16 ounce cans of tomatoes, salt to taste. Two cups of hot water. Now put the meat, the onions, and the cloves of garlic, which have been finely chopped into a large skillet, and sear till grayish. <coughs> Add the rest of the ingredients, bring to boil, lower the heat, and simmer <laughs> for an hour with the cover of the skillet. <laughs> thinking chili con carne is Mexican food. That ain't true. Mexicans disclaim authorship. One contemporary Mexican dictionary has this scornful definition of chili con carne. A detestable dish sold from Texas to New York City and erroneously described as Mexican. Yeah. Green. <laughs> so there's much evidence that chili con carne had its beginnings in Texas, probably in San Antonio early in the 19th century. Oh. Chili, as we know in the United States, can be found in Mexico today, yeah. except in a few spots that cater to tourists. <laughs> if chili had come from Mexico, it'd still be there. For Mexicans, especially those of Indian ancestry, do not change their culinary customs from one generation or even from one century to another. So chili con carne originated in San Antonio amongst the poorest classes of people. Now sidewalk vendors of chili became a conspicuous part of the night scene in San Antonio. Old Henry, that short story writer, was the first, it seems, to tell about the chili queens in a fiction story. Well, it's a shame it's probably one of the worst he ever wrote. It's called the Enchanted Kiss, and the main character in this yarn is a shy drugstore clerk named Tansy. Often, Tansy strolled down to the chili creeds to partake of the delectable chili con carne, a dish evolved by the genius of Mexico, comprised of meats minced with aromatic herbs and the poignant chili Colorado. The titillating odor of this concoction came now on the breeze to the nostrils of Tansy, awakening in him a hunger for it. Well, now actually, Tansy, our shy chili head, was having a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> but the enchanted kiss shows that old Henry believed that chili con pony originated in Mexico. But then he never was much of a historical researcher. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the chili queens reigned by night on the streets of San Antonio until 1943.
that for me, baby. Okay? Can you smell it? Yeah, smell it. finding among the 17th century wild Indians and writing down a chili con carne recipe that would pass muster with most chili purists today. A mysterious Spanish nun, <laughs> Sister Mary of Agrita, entered a convent in Castilla near the Aragon border <laughs> in 1618 <laughs> when she was 16. Ooh, and two years later, she began to cast spells. She would go into trances, in which her body appeared almost lifeless for days. She would say that her spirit had been transported to a far away land. There, she said, her spirit preached Christianity to the savages. It is certain she never left Spain in the flesh. Dear to son, she was the ghost in the Don de of the Lady of Moon. A legend among the Indians of the Southwest. Never rolled a time. I rolled it in trances. 
one of his uh, not-so-literate friends admiringly as a something-seldom sort of a man. <laughs> now, Robert Sprinkle Poole certainly <laughs> is a unique personality. Yeah. For example, he used to celebrate his birthday by going down to the pound and buying out all the dogs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, friends to whom he donated the dogs got so they dreaded for Bob's birthday to come around. <laughs> Now, for about a dozen years after World War II, Bob was the high priest of Chile con carne. Whoa! In Dallas. <laughs> His temple was a red-fronted narrow parlor with red and white checkered claws on the table. Kid, you're off. Come on. 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 <laughs> the pool place was across the street from the celebrated specialty store, Neiman Marcus. <laughs> now once, during a small slump in business at the store, the big boss of Neiman Marcus, Stanley Marcus, lectured his salespeople. You all must be living on Bob Pool Chili, the way the customers are backing off from you. Oh. Now, this was a reference to the uh, loud breath one acquired from one of Bob's superlative bowls of red. And Mr. Marcus was in a position to know, for he was a frequent patron of the parlor. Yeah. Poole heard about Mr. Marcus's remarks and took it ill. You run the store and I'll run my chili joint. Yeah. <laughs> To illustrate the devotion of Poole's clientele, let's take the case of James Henry Hickerson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He flew home from Paris, France in 1951 to attend his daughter's wedding. Colonel Hickerson had been in Paris for months as an intelligence officer and General Eisenhower's shaped staff. Did the colonel rush home immediately upon landing at the Dallas airport? No! no. He headed for Bob Poole's chili parlor. That's right. He sat down at that table, covered in a red and white checkered cloth, and spoke in earnest tones to the proprietor. This is the moment I've been dreaming about all these months. Yeah. Bring me a bowl of red. Yeah. No beans. Oh, no. Oh. I love my job in Paris. The French are wonderful people. <laughs> my wife is going back with me. Oh, There's only one thing wrong so far. No Texas-style chili. Oh. He had three bowls. Carlos Ashley, a former poet laureate of Texas, returned from a European trip when he sat down and wrote some verses about a chili maker he had known as a child. Mr. Ashley, uh, the district attorney of uh, Llano County, told of the famous places he had patronized. Then the DA rested his case. Yet no chef has ever challenged the high gastronomic point that was mine in early childhood at Bob Sears Chili John. <laughs> well, Rogers, the late Oklahoma humorous and film actor, said that he judged the town by the chili it served. Yeah. Now he sampled chili in hundreds of small towns, especially in Texas and Oklahoma. Kept a box score. Will finally concluded that the finest chili of his experience was in a small cafe in Coleman, Texas. Yeah. The greetings for this concoction included mountain oysters from a pool, not 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 a calf, <laughs> raised on the slopes of the Santa Ana Mountains. No. A mountain 
like there's being a term for the testicles of an ex-bull. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger claimed he never met a man he didn't like. Yep. I once cussed out a California cafe operator for serving me an inferior bowl of chili. Yes. Well, Dave Chasen, the owner of Chasen's Restaurant in Beverly Hills, uh, California, kid. probably serves more chili to international celebrities than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, this includes personalities ranging from J. Edgar Hoover to uh, James Stewart and from Ms. Ellen Roosevelt to Elizabeth Taylor. Uh huh? <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor loved chili. Oh. Chasen's chili, that is. Uh, while she was living in Beverly Hills, oh. some years ago, she was in my establishment almost every night for a bowl or two. <laughs> and of course you've heard about me sending her frozen chili to Rome during the shooting of the picture, Cleo Patrick. Like a cup. <laughs> Please send ten quarts and dry ice to four four eight via Apia Ping Tay. Love and kisses, Elizabeth Taylor. I am sorry to report, though, that real chili bug wouldn't give Dave's product a passing grade. Well, it, it is actually a fine stew. Yes, ma'am. Fitted with chili powder. The ingredients are one half pound of pinto beans, five cups of canned tomatoes, one pound of chopped sweet pepper, one and a half tablespoons of salad oil, one and a half pounds of chopped onions, two crushed cloves. chili makers that chili peppers work wonders with inferior grades of beef. And just as Will Rogers came to judge a town by the quality of his chili, so veteran wrongdoers came to raid a jail by his chili score. Yeah. In the old days, jail bars raided my chili the best served behind bars. Yeah. <laughs>
try and escape from the chili. <laughs> <laughs> now, chili would never have had wide acceptance, though, if it hadn't been for the powder men. William Gebhardt and DeWitt Clinton Pendery. Pendery was a well-dressed, well-educated <laughs> man of 32 when he arrived in Fort Worth in 1870 from his uh, native Cincinnati, Ohio. He did not receive a hospitable reception <laughs> as he alighted from the stagecoach. A bemused cowboy shot off the visitor's tall silk stovepipe hat. <laughs> Calmly picked up his hat from the dusty streets of Fort Worth, adjusted it casually, and went on his way unhurriedly. His coolness aroused the admiration of the local marksmen, who often thus met stagecoaches and initiated male newcomers into the quaint mores of Fort Worth. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't near as bad as the initiation ceremony then conducted on the Texas side of the Red River in some ports, where jokesters made uh, newcomers. Drink a hatful of the highly mineralized waters of that crimson stream. <laughs> Before being formally granted admittance into Texas. <laughs> In 1890, I decided to devote my entire business to providing pepper pods and spices for chili and tamales. In that same year, I started grinding an excellent blend of chili powder, which I called Chilaboline from pepper pods, oregano, cumin seeds, and garlic. perfect world comes from a can. <laughs> Some of it pretty terrible, at least by pure standards. And yet, Gebhardt to San Antonio, the company that made the first commercial can chili in 1908, and such admirable marks as Wolf Brand and Ashley's and uh, Fritos and uh, Ireland's Iron Kettle still follow classic recipes. Yes, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Well, when he didn't have time to make his own pot of chili or couldn't find a satisfactory bowl in the cafe, Will Rogers turned to canned chili. His favorite was Wolf Brand. Now, once Rogers was producing a national radio show from Mexico City, and he commented that he had searched that Mexican capital in vain for a bowl of red or the bowl of blessedness, <laughs> as he called it, he then commented, 
On my way home to Oklahoma, I'm going to stop off in Corsicana, Texas, and load up with several cases of Wolf Brand Chili. Then I'll be prepared in the future for emergencies such as this one. <laughs> Wolf Brand had humble beginnings. Its founder was a man by the name of Lyman T. Davis. Now, in 1885, Lyman Davis was a land poor rancher uh, who also owned a meat market in Carsicana. Now, he was a chili head and particularly fond of that produced by a farmer range cook whose name is no longer remembered. Davis began canning chili in 1921, the rear of his meat market. He named his brand in honor of his pet wolf, Kaiser Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Feel like it's a bill on each can. <clears throat> Wolf Brand today produces canned chili by the millions of cans, and they still follow the old cook formula, and the label still bears the picture of Kaiser Bill, the pet wolf. Neighbor? Yeah. How long's it been since you had a big fat steaming bowl of Wolf Brand chili? <laughs>
47, George Hathaway and Jim Fuller founded the Chili Appreciation Society, which is now called the International Chili Appreciation Society, as they have chapters all over the world, including one launched with considerable ceremony in the autumn of 1964 in Mexico City, the fount of chili con carne in the public mind, yet in truth, a chili desert until the Appreciation Society did some missionary work. <laughs> the headquarters and the parent chapter of this tough-mouthed gourmet association is located over in Dallas. <laughs> One of their priorities is to improve the quality of chili in restaurants and, and broadcast Texas-style recipes all over the earth. Yeah. George Hathaway, the president, or uh, international chief chili head, and other zealous members have even resorted to violence when reports about bad chili in cafes went unheeded. Mm -hmm. Now, George Hathaway is also the editor of an aviation magazine called Flight, mm -hmm. and he gets around all over the nation in his own airplane testing local chili when he has a stomach for it. <laughs> At a cafe in the Houston airport, he was served some alleged chili, which he called the worst in his experience. One ingredient of this atrocity was Boston baked beans. <laughs> Now, the chief chili head is one of those connoisseurs that likes his pinto beads on the side, if at all. Yeah. Well, hell yeah. And the sight of those sweet Boston baked beans in the bowl was too much for Hathaway's patience. Yeah. He said to the waitress very quietly, Miss, would you have the chef come out here? Because I want to see him taste this horrible mess. <laughs> the chef refused to make an appearance. Oh, George then arose, picked the bowl up with one hand, opened the swinging door into the kitchen, and threw the bowl of chili in the chair. <laughs> Although he, he didn't hit him. Oh. The chef came out then, mad as a pint of hornets, and called an airport policeman. George would have gone to jail, no doubt, if the policeman hadn't been knowledgeable about chili. <laughs> the officer listened to Hathaway's and the cook's explanation of the affair. The policeman then commended Hathaway and proceeded to tongue lash the chef, <laughs> declaring that anybody who puts Boston baked beans in chili con carne deserve to have bad things happen to them. Yeah. 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 Well, George made his peace with the chef and supplied him with the instructions for making real chili. <laughs> Since that time, there have been no complaints about that cafe from any of the chili heads. I wonder why. <laughs> the society's chapters will have luncheon and dinner maintenance about once a month. Over steaming bones, they discuss missionary endeavors, such as sending approved and mimeographed copies of recipes to chili lovers anywhere. <laughs> a thoughtful 
stupid enough to include a, ch a stamp and address envelope in their request. <laughs> the Chile missionaries get letters from people all over the world, mostly complaining about the, the local Chile or the total lack of it. Yeah. California probably has the lousiest chili makers in the nation. Yeah. <laughs> chili Appreciation Society has real chili recipes and the answers are not there. Yeah. Alaska yeah. yeah. <laughs> is probably the end of the world when it comes to trying to get a bowl of chili. Yeah. 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 I haven't found any real chili since I was in Texas in 1942. Yeah. 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 Chili here along the Great Lakes is not much more than a mildly peppery tomato soup. <laughs> for the real thing. <laughs> we have a brave little band here in Cincinnati who appreciate good chili. And we would like to start a chapter <laughs> in your society. Yeah. <laughs> stenographic work and the society is a non-dues paying organization <laughs> and then sending out all this chili literature with members furnishing their own secretarial services has caused chapters to spring up all over including chapters in London cauldrons of chili and dry lice have been air freighted to, to chapters in London and in Germany. <laughs> hey, people all over Italy have translated your recipe and have fallen in love with the dish. Chile is a sensation in this country. We, 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 we would like a little badge to signify the membership. <laughs> <laughs> a lady new to Texas came into a Dallas restaurant saw a local chapter in session in the corner of the joint and at first glance took this luncheon meeting to be a gathering of religious fanatics or political extremists. <laughs> Why, the men were all standing around the table mumbling in unison. <laughs> <laughs> arms were outstretched in a kind of double Nazi salute. <laughs> Now later she realized that what she had witnessed was the cracker crumbling ritual <laughs> with which all chapters begin their meal. The Society's Bible is a book on chili, now out of print, but undoubtedly the first of its kind. It was written by the late Joe Cooper of Dallas. The complete title is with or without beans being a compendium to perpetuate the internationally famous bowl of chili, Texas style, which occupies such an important place in modern civilization. <laughs> a quote from Joe's book is the society's motto. The aroma of good chili should generate rapture akin to a lover's kiss. <laughs> To illustrate how, how far the society will go in its missionary work, a committee of international officials from Dallas, <laughs> Hathaway, and Chief Chili Cook Whip Fowler, flew to Mexico City for investor ceremonies for that new chapter. At the first meeting, 50 Mexicans were introduced to Texas style chili and became members of La Sociedad de Aficionado al Chili con Carne Internacional. <laughs> Un momentito. Oh. Viva Chile con Carne la Wick Fowler. Copia fiel de la receta original para 12 personas. For 12 people. Ingredientes: un y medio kilogramos de carne molida, un kilogramo de tomates maduros, una cebolla grande picada, dos dientes de ajos finamente picados, una cucharita de sal, una cucharita de pimienta, una cucharita de orégano, una cuchara de comino, cuatro cucharas de chile en polvo tipo pequeño, not too hot, y una cuchara de paprika. Forma de prepararse. Se fríe la carne en un sartén junto con la cebolla y el ajo. Cuando está perfectamente durada, se le arregla el tomate con una poquita de agua. Se le añada los demás ingredientes con una poquita de agua y se revuelve muy bien. Se añada los demás ingredientes, le pone agua caliente para que se espare. 
Y al final... ¡Ajá! ¡Ajá! Y al final... Nota, versiones modernas de chile con carne, también se le pueden poner una cucharita de salsa tabasco. The inexperience should be one. Real chile con carne is not for sissy. Mr. Fowler said what he called tour lamb chili. His fur lamb chili was reputed to open 18 sinus cavities unknown to the medical profession. Muy picoso. Texas has an unusual number of left-handed school children, all using their little south paws to spoon up greasy Texas chili. <laughs> If ever a barge full runs aground off Corpus Christi, no amount of detergent will clean the scum off the beaches of the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> in the autumn of 1967, Terlingua, Texas became the site of the world's annual chili cook-off. Something <laughs>
weird setting. One of geological savage beauty. This land is called the Big Bend because it is here that the Rio Grande takes a 400 mile abrupt turn from its normal southern flow to almost due north through mountains 8,000 feet high on the U.S. side and higher on the Mexican shore. And near Terlingua, the river flows lustily through awesome narrow gorges, sometimes between sheer cliffs 2,000 feet high. Until recent years, Terlingua was probably the most satisfactory ghost town on the Rio Grande. Even today, the town looks a little like a big and abandoned Indian pueblo with many roofless adobe and stone buildings blending in mauve and yellow colors with the spiky landscape and the usually iridescent sky. Once, Terlingua was the capital of the richest quicksilver mining country in the U.S. For example, in 1922, 40% of the cinnabar in this country was mined there. One story has it that uh, Howard Perry, who was from Portland, Maine, bought for $150 the 1,280 acres encompassing the future town site of Terlingua and the mines from Richard M. Gano, surveyor, preacher, and uh, ancestor of Howard Hughes. <laughs> Old man Perry was proud of his town during his heyday. He was a man of slight stature. The climate of Tulane was quite sunny, even in midwinter. And while there, Mr. Perry appeared each day in a fresh, white linen suit. And he usually wore a tall straw hat with a vivid bow. When I first come here, it was just me, two jackasses. <laughs> now look what I created. Oh. <laughs> the original Trilingua was down near where Trilingua Creek and Dirty Woman Creek runs into the Rio Grande and was probably called Trace Lingos for the three languages spoke at an early Indian trading post. Spanish, English, and Comanche. This was the court language of this country, even though it was primarily Apache land. Anyhow, by, by the time I'd established my town near the mines, Trace Lingos had been corrupted into Tilingua. Yeah. Well, the idea for the annual World Chili Cook-Off competition was Frank X. Talbert's and Tom Tyranny's. Now, they matched the chief cook of the Chili Appreciation Society International, uh, the great Wick Fowler, <laughs> against H. Uh, Allen Smith, author of many humor books such as Low Man on a Totem Pole and Life in a Putty Knife Factory. <laughs> <laughs> Who was at the time living on a milk and goat farm near Mount Kisco, New York. <laughs> Now, Smith wrote an article full of anti-Texas ravens entitled, Nobody Knows More About Chili Than I Do. <laughs> this Smith character would be perfect to meet Whitford in the cook-off. Yeah. The theme of Smith's cherished 3,000-word tantrum was, Number one, Texans can't cook chili. <laughs> Number two, on cash. Yeah. 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 This will be like a wrestling match. Yeah. Our hero, Quick <laughs> Fowler, yeah. against that eastern bad mouther of Texas style chili, a real villain. Boo! Ah, you Casey members are a bunch of childish, semi rump Rotarian cracker breakers. <laughs> All withered and pockmarked from eating that mud pudding Texans choose to call chili. Where are you? <laughs> I'm gathering up all the copies of Cole Colbert's book on chili and burn them in the public square in Mount Pisco. <laughs> I've just been advised by my New York agent <laughs> that I've been challenged to a duel. Yeah. Wickford P. Fowler has flung down the gauntlet and offered to cook chili against me. 
Fowler, in collaboration with that varlet, ex Talbert, <laughs> have unleashed a torrent of abuse against me, saying that I have taken to my bed with Buff Orpington syndrome. <laughs> I'm in a deep fury. <laughs> my fidelity to the Middle Western concept of chili has been wounded. If I can locate a horsewhip, I'm coming to Dallas, and I'm going to whip ex Talbert right in front of his Dallas News colleagues. <laughs> and as long as I have to pay for the airline fare, it'll be my pleasure to horsewhip any other Texans who pretend to a knowledge of chili. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> be prepared to start cooking at high noon yeah. interlingua tips. <laughs> high noon. Yeah. A fitting hour for treachery. Gary Cooper had no one but Colby and Pierce and the black-hearted Miller brothers to defeat at his high noon encounter. Well, I have 209 childish lard heads and a houseboat jockey to defeat. When I <laughs> now, Texans, for historical reasons, believe that any chili that isn't theirs is trickery. Yes, sir. Texans might even react violently to the fresh tomatoes and the sweet bell peppers and all those other ingredients of this so-called school of chili. <laughs> Casey is a self-appointed police force against that practice. Smith allowed himself to be coerced from his home in Mountain Case, Go, New York, to the ghost town of Tlingua in the remote Big Bend country. He had played himself into the hands of them. <laughs> well, only foolish pride or incurable dope habit would force a man into the Big Bend to take a chance he knew he didn't have. Anybody who would put sweet bell peppers in chili ought to be shot. I never do anything for which I have to apologize. Always when it appears that I have committed an evil act, there are extenuating circumstances. Oh, well, tell us about My it. wife sneaks into the kitchen when I am not there uh -huh. and drops sweet bell peppers in my chili pot. Oh, it's a little woman, is it? <laughs> now, as you all well know, it has long been fashionable for men to work themselves to death for their women, uh, yeah. leaving their wives in the lap of luxury. <laughs> well, I have an intense desire to outlive my wife. It's my hope that in my final years, I'll be able to make a pot of chili without any sweet bell peppers in it. <laughs> then come on down here and try. Come on down here. Come on down here. test the chili, the three judges was blindfolded. Although the blindfolds wasn't necessary since they all knew that Smith's recipe called for kidney beans. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Fowler's recipe was all beef and seasoning. Mm. Fowler cooked magnificent chili. Yeah. Only Smith came down with the case of the hives and had Fowler. <laughs> Quick Fowler is the world's greatest chili cook. Yeah. Yeah. Only uh, Wickford lost again in 69. Oh. At the 1970 cook-off, there were some attractive yet uninvited female contestants. 
<laughs> Janice Constantine tried to influence the judges with the mini, mini costume. <laughs> Simmer down. Her chili, however, was rated poorly by the judges, including the only woman on the panel, actress Ruta Lee of Los Angeles. <laughs> and Beth, me, Mom, McQueen. Very good looking girl. Stood around looking cruelly beautiful. Yes. The results in her pot were rated poor. Oh. <laughs> Referee Talbert had permitted the girls to compete, fearing that otherwise the 2,000 or more women in the crowd might riot. <laughs> there has never been any prejudice against girl cooks at Terralingua, except in the case of H. Allen Smith. But well, he's been suffered to be a judge. And chili is a man's dish. No woman should ever be allowed near an iron chili pot. Chili is a man's dish, I said. It should only be cooked by male humanoids. Arrest those two women on a charge of trying to cook chili while then and there being female persons. <laughs> Goat's balls! <laughs> well, now then. After the cook-off, there was a date! <laughs> 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 Of peppers all mixed up in the meat for, for Papa and me. 
And those pots kept us on Saturday night. Well, at least we weren't about to go prowling till way after supper was over. <laughs> and Mama always saved enough so we could have chili on our scrambled eggs for breakfast Sunday morning. <laughs> I always jumped out of bed early on Sunday morning. <laughs> Yeah. 